Hello and welcome. My name is Christina and I'm the Education Coordinator with the DuPage County Farm Bureau. If this is your first time joining us, we're really happy to have you. And if you've been following along, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about pollination. And I know that we have touched on pollination a little bit in some of our other lessons. But today we're going to do a deep dive into pollination and learn what it is, why it's important to agriculture, and some of the important pollinators. So first, I want to start you off with this question, what is pollination? Go ahead and push pause and I want you to discuss it with your class. If you know the answer, great. If you're not sure, go ahead and talk it out. So the definition of pollination is the movement of pollen from the stamen to the pistil of a flower. And pollination is allowing the flower to reproduce and form seeds or fruit. So pollen, pollen is that fine yellowish powder that fertilizes the plant. So you can see it in this picture here. Um, this is the stuff that the pollinators are moving from flower to flower to actually pollinate the plant. So to understand pollination, we really need to understand what the different parts of the flower do. So each part of the flower plays a really important part in the pollination process. So we'll start with the stamen. Um, you can see it over on the left. The stamen is the male part of the flower and it's made up of two different parts. Um, it's made up of the anther and the filament. Now the anther is labeled on this picture. You can see it's that top part. The anther is the part that's actually containing the pollen. And then the filament is that tube part underneath that's holding the anther up. So together, those two pieces make up the stamen and the stamen is the male part. So then if we move on to the pistil, the pistil is the female part of the flower and it's made up of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Now the ovary is the only one on here that's labeled, but we need to talk about all three parts. So the stigma is the top part, um, and it's the part that actually receives the pollen. And then the style is the piece below it that's connecting the stigma down to the ovary. Now the ovary contains these things called ovules, and once they're pollinated, that's the part that actually turns into seeds. So that part's really important. So then if we move on to the petal, and I'm sure you guys all know what the petal is, um, and these are the brightly colored pieces, and the job of the petal is to attract pollinators to come over to the flower. So then we move down to the sepal, and the sepal is the part that encloses and protects the other parts of the flower. So if you ever see a flower before it blooms um, and it's enclosed, that's the sepal that's protecting the inside part, and then it actually opens up once the flower is ready to bloom. So then we move down to the bract, and the bract is kind of like a leaf. It's where the flower rises up from. Um, sometimes it's mistaken for a petal just because they can be brightly colored, and they also help to attract pollinators. So then we go down to our leaf, and the leaf is the part that's providing food to the plant through photosynthesis. Now there are a couple of different kinds of pollination. Um, the first is cross-pollination. Now cross-pollination means that pollen is being transferred from, the from one flower of a plant to the flower of another plant. So a good example of this is our pumpkin flowers. If we remember from our pumpkin lesson, pumpkins have both a male and female flower and the pollen has to be moved from one to the other. And a lot of times the pollinators will be moving them from plant to plant. Then we have self-pollination. And I'm sure you can probably guess what self-pollination is based on its name. Self-pollination is when the flower is transferred from the stamen to the pistil um, of the same flower or plant. So an example of this is tomatoes. Um, tomato flowers have both the male and female part um, that are necessary for pollination. And the pollen can just drop down directly from the stamen to the pistil and fertilize the plant. So based on all of this, I want you to take a minute um, and just think about why pollination is so important to agriculture. And you can pause this and discuss it with your class. So it's estimated that three quarters of flowering plants and about 35% of the world's food depend on pollinators. 
Um, without pollinators or the creatures um, that are moving the pollen from flower to flower, a lot of the fruits and vegetables that we like wouldn't exist. Um, some scientists estimate that one out of every three bites of food that we take exists because of pollinators. Um, and pollination is, you know, what allows the plant to make seeds. And seeds are the first step in our plant life cycle. So without pollination in seeds, our plants won't exist. So this is just a picture to kind of give you an idea of some of the foods that wouldn't exist without pollinators. So some of these might be your favorites. Maybe you really like fruits like apples or berries or even chocolate or coffee. So a lot of these or all of these on this page would not exist uh, without the help from pollinators. So who are pollinators? Um, pollinators are the ones that are moving the pollen around to help um, fertilize the plants. So a lot of times we'll think of insects. Those are a very popular pollinator, but there are a lot of others. So we'll start off with insects. Um, so insects are attracted to flowers as a food source. Um, they're looking for pollen and nectar. Um, and as they move from flower to flower, that pollen will stick to their bodies and be transferred from flower to flower along the way. Now bats are another pollinator and bats feed on nectar um, of flowers and so in the same way the pollen will stick to their bodies and be moved along as they fly from plant to plant. So next we have birds. Um, some birds feed on nectar. There's about 2,000 different uh, species of birds throughout the world that feed on nectar. So probably the one that you're most familiar with is the hummingbird. So the next time you see a hummingbird, just realize that they are a helpful pollinator. So then we move on to wind. Um, wind pollinates things like grasses and trees and some agriculture crops like wheat and corn. So if we think back to our corn lesson, remember the pollen was stored in the tassels or that very top part of the plant. And so it relies on the wind to blow that pollen out of the tassel so that it can fall onto the silks and then those pollinated silks will make the kernel or the seed. And then our last form of pollination is water. Um, this is the least common type of pollination, but it does happen. Um, the pollen can float on the surface of water until it makes contact with another plant. Sometimes it could even travel underwater, um, but this is the most rare kind and mostly it's done by plants like water weeds and pond weeds and things like that. So I want to talk about two very specific um, pollinators with you. Um, so the first one we're going to talk about is butterflies and specifically the monarch butterfly. So the monarch butterfly, you might know, is our Illinois state insect. Um, they live in North, South, and Central America, but they can also live in places like Australia, some of the Pacific Islands, India, and Western Europe. Now, the North American monarchs, they have to migrate every year. Um, they have to go south in the fall to avoid the cold winters here. So they have to fly about 2,000 miles to get to either Southern California or Mexico. Now, monarchs only live about two to six weeks, but the last generation of the season can live up to eight to nine months. So what's really cool is as these butterflies are flying along their path, they'll be laying eggs. And when those eggs hatch, um, those butterflies will continue the migration as well. So it's pretty cool that they know how to do that. Now something really important to monarchs are milkweeds. Um, milkweeds are actually the only plant that monarch caterpillars eat. And so uh, milkweed is actually poisonous. So when the caterpillars eat the milkweed, they actually become poisonous themselves and then predators won't eat them. So in recent years, there's been a really big push to to plant more milkweed in Illinois um, so that there's a bigger food source for the monarch butterflies. So let's talk about our butterfly life cycle. And so butterflies go through this cool thing called metamorphosis. Um, and metamorphosis um, means that their bodies are changing completely. So our first step is the butterflies are laying eggs, um, and that can be between the spring and the fall, depending on what species of butterfly it is. Um, and those leaves are really important because in the next step, they're actually becoming the food source. So does anyone know what the next step of the butterfly life cycle is? Go ahead and shout it out if you know it. 
caterpillars. So caterpillars actually hatch from the eggs. Um, and the caterpillar's job is to eat and eat and eat and build up that food as energy. Now caterpillars will grow up to 100 times their original size. And they actually split and shed their skin kind of like a snake does because they're growing so much. So they'll split and shed their skin four to five times. So then we move on to our next step, which is the chrysalis. Now during this stage, uh, the cells inside the caterpillar's body are changing um, and it's growing things like legs and eyes and wings and other parts that the butterfly needs that it didn't have before. And this can take anywhere from a few weeks to months. Um, it just depends on what species of butterfly it is. So then we go to our last step where the butterfly actually emerges from the chrysalis. Now these butterflies, their wings are usually damp at this point, so they have to wait for their wings to dry out before they can actually fly away. So then these butterflies will eat and mate and lay eggs and then their life cycle continues. All right, so our next insect we're going to talk about is the honeybee. And honeybees are really cool because they are considered a livestock by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In Illinois, we have about 1,770 farms that are raising honeybees. And they, one, are pollinators, which is awesome. And then two, they produce honey, which we buy and sell and eat as a commodity. So if we think back to our apple lesson, you may remember that some um, orchards will keep honeybees on their property to help with pollination um, so that they have a good apple crop. So let's talk about the different kinds of bees that are in a colony. So the first one is the worker bees. And the worker bees are really important because they do a lot of different jobs. The worker bees are all females and they do things like collect the pollen and the nectar, feed the queen and larva, make wax and honey, and keep the hive clean. Now the worker bees will live five to six weeks in the active season, so spring to fall, but then in the winter months, when they're less active, they can live four to six months. So then we move on to the queen bee. The queen bee is the largest bee in the colony and she is the one who is laying the eggs. That's her only job. Um, queens will live between one and a half to three years usually. Um, sometimes they could live up to five, but that's pretty uncommon. And so then we have our drones, and the drones are the only males in the hive. The only job that the drones have is to mate with the queen so that she can lay fertilized eggs. Um, drones actually die after mating, so they don't live very long. If for some reason they don't mate and they live longer, they'll live a few months, but during the fall, the worker bees will actually kick the drones out of the hive so that they don't have to feed them during the winter. All right, so let's look at the honeybee life cycle. So we start off with our queen bee who's going to lay an egg in one of the cells of the honeycomb. Now, if the egg is fertilized, it will become either a worker or potentially a new queen. If it's unfertilized, it will become a drone. So after about four to six days, that egg will hatch into a larva, and the worker bees will feed the larva a mixture of nectar and pollen, and this is called bee bread. So that's a pretty fun name to remember, bee bread. <laughs> so then once the larva is fed, the cell is capped, um, and then that larva turns into a pupa. Now the pupa doesn't eat at all, it just finishes the transformation into an adult honeybee. Um, so this whole process takes about 21 days. So then the adult bee will emerge from the cell and then it will begin its job, whether it's a worker, a drone, or maybe a new queen. So bees live in hives, and sometimes we'll use the terms hives and colonies interchangeably, um, but hives are really referring to the structures that the bees live in. So you can see in the picture on the left, um, that's a picture of a honeybee hive, and the colony, when we say colony, we're talking about the family or group of bees that live inside the hive. So on average, there's about 10,000 to 60,000 bees that live in a hive. And the hives are made up of boxes that are stacked on top of each other. And inside those boxes um, are frames. So you can see in the picture on the right, that man is holding up a frame. Um, the frames are coated in wax, and that's what the honeybees are building their beeswax on um, and making their honeycomb. 
So the honeycomb is made up of six-sided cells. Um, so they are really efficient because they can fit the most cells in the best amount of space possible. And they use this for storing their honey. Now the worker bees are, are collecting nectar and pollen from plants. So during this, they're actually helping to pollinate too. So you can see I've circled some pollen that's stuck to the bee's leg in this picture. Um, a lot of times during the colder months when there aren't a lot of plants available, beekeepers will actually put out sugar water for their bees so that they have a food source. So the pollen is used to make bee bread, which is fed to the larva, and the nectar is used for bee bread as well, but it's also used to make honey. So when the worker bees come back to the hive, they can regurgitate that nectar that was stored in a special sac um, in their body, and then it'll mix with enzymes and they'll put it into one of the honeycomb cells. Um, now they'll leave the cells open and they'll flap their wings over top of it to help dry out some of that moisture, and that is how we get honey. So once those honeycomb cells are full, the bees will cap it with wax, um, and the bees actually use the honey for food. So it's really important that the beekeepers don't over harvest the honey because the bees need to use it as a food source, especially in the colder months when there aren't a lot of flowers or plants available for them to get more nectar and more pollen. Right, so then once the frames are full and we need to collect the honey, uh, beekeepers will use a special machine called a honey extractor. So first they will take the wax capped off of the, the frames um, and then they'll put those frames into the honey extractor and that machine is going to spin really, really fast and the honey is going to flow out of it. So then they will run the honey through a strainer to get out any wax that might be in it and then the honey is put into jars or bottles and it's sealed and then we can buy it. Now honey is really cool because it never goes bad. Um, sometimes it'll get crystallized or a little crunchy when you eat it, but it never spoils so you can really eat it forever. Now Pollinators are really important to us in agriculture. So some farmers have been putting pollinator habitats around their farms to help attract more pollinators. Um, so I wanna show you this quick video so that you can get some idea of what a pollinator habitat looks like. So I'll, let's take a look here. Pollinator habitat is an area that's exclusively set aside for bees and butterflies. We use pollinator habitats as a refuge for insects and um, wildflowers to have a safe place to grow and prosper. And it's important that we do that because as we expand our cities and other things that we want and need in society, it's good to have a focus uh, back to these natural resources and a place to have these, these lands. The bees and the butterflies are one of the main cornerstones to just common biology. So we just need those organisms just for day-to-day -day life. They are very, very important. All the pollinator habitat does is attract the bees to the area, and then the bees will move over as the flower buds start showing up and take pollen from those flowers to pollinate the same flower. We try to increase their population so we have a lot more bees flying around to make sure we get those pollinations to happen when they need to happen. At this point in time, we're, we're doing anything and, and everything we can for the environment, not only the pollinators, but upland game animals as well. Conservation is important to every farmer because it's important for us to take care of the land uh, that helps provide us income to take care of our families and provide more food to the country. So what can we do to help pollinators in our area? So some things that we can do is to provide a safe and attractive habitat for them. So if you ask your parents or maybe your schools, um, you could plant a variety of different flowers. We want flowers that are native to Illinois. And we want to make sure that those different flowers will bloom at different times throughout the year. So from the spring all the way to the fall. That way the pollinators have a food source throughout most of the year. 
It's also important to provide a water source for them, so maybe like a fountain or something. And then we want to protect our bees' nests and butterfly host plants. So if you ever see a bee's nest and it's somewhere dangerous, there are places you can call and they'll come and remove the bee's nest and move it somewhere safe. And then just knowing what type of plants butterflies need. So if we think back to our milkweed, we know that milkweed is poisonous, so maybe we don't want it around places where it can be dangerous to people, but it's important to have it because it's a food source for our monarch caterpillars. So those are just some things to think about. And that is all I have for you today. So thanks uh, for watching and we will see you later.